Our Old Testament reading this morning is taken from Genesis chapter 17, from verse 9 through to verse 14. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And then we move to the New Testament, Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, from verse 1 through to verse 10. This is after Paul has been speaking about the things that are happening in that church. He starts, This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others, since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we will live with him to serve you. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong. Not that people will see that we have stood the test, but that you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong. And our prayer is for, you, for your perfection. This is why I write these things when I am absent, that when I come, I may not have to be harsh with you, have to be harsh in my use of authority, the authority the Lord gave me for building you up and not tearing you down. We give thanks to God for his word. So how many of us take a step back sometimes to look at ourselves, to see what we're doing, to assess the impact that our lives are having? You know, to do a self-assessment. I know a lot of companies do self-assessments on a yearly basis to see where their employees are in the life of the company, to see if they are still of, of value to the company. You know, self-assessments, and this is what I got off the internet, self-assessments are a great way to analyze your work performance and any areas for growth. You can customize self-assessments to include the criteria that best fit your life and professional career. If you're planning for the future or developing new aspirations, reflecting on your strengths, weaknesses, values, and accomplishments can help you determine what goals to work towards next. But have you ever thought about doing a self-assessment of your spiritual life? In this final chapter of 2 Corinthians, Paul is ending his letter to the church in Corinth with some final warnings. He said all about, about all that he can say, and most of the church has repented and changed its attitude not only to the, towards the Lord, but to him as well. And he's rejoicing over that. But there is still a handful of people there who are following the false teachers that have infiltrated the church. And there are still some who are living in open immorality. And the apostle has already told them that there is nothing left for this church except public exposure when he comes. And when he comes, he says, that is what he's going to do with them. He's going to expose their sins. And when he arrives, anyone living in unrepentant sin will not be spared his discipline. 
everyone in the church, and I'm sure in the community too, will learn that Christ speaks through Paul. Because Christ will deal powerfully with their sinfulness through Paul. As Paul says there in verse 10. So that I may not have to be harsh in the use of my authority. The authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not tearing you down. And now, before he does come to the church in Corinth, he faces them with one final statement, which he hopes will change their attitude and make them clear up their difficulties. And this is found in verse 5 of our text. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Is Jesus Christ in you? Paul exhorts every individual in the church to ask themselves that question. And this, of course, is because all wrong behavior leads at last to that question. Is Christ Jesus in you? Now, how many times have we seen or heard of a great name in the church when they've come forward and confessed of some grievous sin that they've committed? I remember many years ago, Jimmy Swaggart doing that. And more recently, Bill Hybels of Willow Creek Church and Brian Houston of Hillsong Church. And there have been many others as well. And they've all had to step down from their positions of power, can we say, within the church because of what they had done. Now, what was brought into the light regarding their shameful, sinful ways. And sometimes we hear a politician or a celebrity say that they are a Christian, a, a follower of Jesus, and the Christian community rejoices at their confession. But then they do or say something that puts their confession in a different light. The attitude and the behavior on their part is inconsistent with the profession of being a follower of Christ. And so many people ask, is this person really a Christian? And that immediately becomes moot when there is behavior that is not in line with a Christian's life in Christ. Others ask it, and as the Apostle Paul makes clear here, it is a good thing to ask of yourself as well. And so the question we should be asking ourselves right now is, am I a Christian? Have I really been changed? Is Jesus Christ living in me? And for the Jews of the Old Testament, the way that you identified as being a Jew, particularly regarding the males, was circumcision. The commandment to circumcise was a covenant made with Abraham and God. And it's recorded there in Genesis chapter 17, as we, as we heard from our text this morning. But God says that this is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. You are to undergo circumcision. And it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. See, this commandment states quite clearly that the circumcision acts as an outward physical sign of the eternal covenant between God and the Jewish people. And so the effects of circumcision were always there to remind one of this covenant relationship that you had as part of the Jewish nation, as, as with Almighty God. You know, the one who had brought his people out of Egypt and into the promised land, that land that was flowing with milk and honey, the one who had driven out the pagan nations before them as they took possession of what he had promised. And in a way, this was a perpetual examination of self, as it was this tangible sign, this visible sign of what you were called to be and how you were called to act. But as New Testament Christians, we know that we are no longer under the Old Testament law and that circumcision is no longer a requirement. And this is brought out in a number of New Testament passages, like Acts chapter 15, where there were some people who were teaching that circumcision was a requirement to be saved. But Paul and Barnabas refuted it by saying that it was through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we were saved. And in Galatians chapter 5, Paul makes it clear that the, the need to be circumcised removes value from what Christ had done on the cross. And there are other passages in the New Testament that say similar things about this outward sign. But we know, 
and Scripture attests to this, that being delivered from our sins is the result of faith in Christ. It is His finished work on the cross that saves, not the observance of some external rite. Even the Old Testament law acknowledged that circumcision alone was insufficient to please God, who himself had specified the needs there in Deuteronomy chapter 10 to circumcise your hearts. And Paul picks up on that in Romans chapter 2. When it comes to salvation, the works of the flesh accomplish nothing. As Paul writes in Galatians 2 verse 16, where he says that we know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And so the very fact that Paul could pose such a statement like, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith, test yourselves, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you, unless, of course, you fail the test, indicates that this is what marks a true Christian. A Christian isn't someone who simply joins a church and sits in the pew Sunday after Sunday. A Christian isn't someone who adheres to a certain moral standard. You know, well, I live by the Ten Commandments, or I follow the teachings of Jesus. Or the fact that you read the Bible consistently, that doesn't make you a Christian. Or that you give you of your time and your finances to the church. The thing that really marks it is if Christ is living in you. You see, a true Christian is someone in whom Christ dwells. As Paul says in verse 5, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Now Paul was so convinced that this was the truth, that as a Christian, Christ lives in us, that he makes mention of it in his letters time and time again, with phrases like, Christ is in you, his son in me. It is Christ who lives in me. Christ is formed in you, and that Christ may make his home in your hearts. And while this is an astonishing truth, it's not one that is easy to grasp. You know, how can Jesus be living in me? I thought he was in heaven at God's right hand after he ascended from earth. But you see, not only is Jesus Christ alive today, but through God's Holy Spirit, that Paul calls the Spirit of Christ in Romans 8 verse 9, he lives and dwells within each and every child of God. The life of Christ in us is our hope of eternal glory. The life of Christ in us is our hope of eternal glory. The Apostle Paul called the indwelling of Christ a, a great mystery when he writes in Colossians 1 verse 27, To them God has chosen to make, make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. The mystery which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. When a person comes to faith in Christ and believes in Jesus' death and resurrection, they are united with Christ, to Christ, and in Christ. First in his death, and then in the newness of his resurrection life. And as the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And as he explained to the church in Rome, in Romans chapter 6, For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. And so we come back to the statement that Paul makes here in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. So examine yourself. See if your old self, the one full of rebellion and sin and unbelief, has died to Christ, who paid the penalty for your sins on the cross. See whether you are in the faith. Because through our union with Christ and his death, we are made alive by God's Spirit to walk in the newness of life because we have been made right with God. As we read in Romans 8 verse 10. Our lives become a vehicle to display the life of Christ. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul writes these words, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has made His light shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. In our ordinary human condition of weakness, we are but jars of clay holding this priceless treasure, the, the life of Christ in us. The challenges we face, the persecution, the trials, the hardship and the suffering that we endure serve to pour out the all-surpassing power of God and reveal the life of Jesus Christ to those around us. We can rest assured that we will not be overcome in all of these afflictions because we have the treasure of Jesus Christ living in us. And then, test yourself. Look at your life. Is there any offensive way in my heart? Is there any area of my life that does not shine the love of God and the cleansing by Jesus? Is there any habit that I am ashamed of? Something that makes me feel guilty when I think of it? Or something that goes against what the Lord has taught? Check for evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in your life. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Jesus himself commands us to bear fruit that lasts. A tough but spiritually beneficial question to ask ourselves regularly is, what is my spiritual condition? In the Old Testament, in Lamentations chapter 3, the prophet Jeremiah called God's people to honest self-evaluation and repentance when he said, let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. And Scripture calls us to test everything, to renounce evil and to hold fast to what is good. Maybe we should consider the words of David there in Psalm 139 at the end and consider making that our prayer as well, where David says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. <music>